about the promoting access to voting executive order and tasked us with making sure vote.gov was translated into languages spoken by any of the language groups covered under Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. These languages are determined by census data. Each year, the U.S. welcomes more than 800,000 new citizens from all over the world. Providing voting information in languages that reflect the diversity of U.S. citizens is an essential way to help people exercise their right to vote. It's also an important way to build trust and inclusivity with the public. Uh, Vote.gov has been around since 2016 and has gone through many iterations before migrating to Google this year. We'll talk more about the history and the language process. So the first important thing to know is we do not use Google Translate. We work with real people and they not automated translation techniques. Um, this means that we have to store all of our content in some way. So Vote.gov used to be a static site built on Google, and this worked well for the initial stage of the website, which had minimal voter registration content only in English and Spanish. However, as language offerings grew and new content was added, three challenges came to light. So there was a reliance on developers for content changes. The impact of inflexible content architecture compounded as more languages were added, and this led to a slow content deployment process. Um, so up here on the left, you'll see content from the old website stored in JSON, and then these were then used to generate the content files. For comparison on the right, you'll see a screenshot of the current homepage content in the Drupal admin interface. The old way relied on developers for content changes, and each language had to have its own file with matching keys. Um, so one thing about the inflexible content architecture, um, the increased time that it took to get updates of content onto the site was a problem, and also tracking those translations as they got added to the site, and tracking revisions on those translations became a problem as well. So the complexity of organizing and managing all the translated data uh, across the static sites um, as more content is added, it just started growing. And we also saw an increased volume of technology associated with all the translation that we had to do. Um, and we saw that there was an imminent need to initialize and maintain a micro system for navigation. So this is an example that you see here in the slow translation process. Um, we know we would not be able, we would, we know we would not be able to decipher or understand a lot of the translations so we collaborated with the translation provider on a solution that would cause the least amount of human error using spreadsheets. The spreadsheets allowed us to organize the content better and facilitate conversion of the static JSON files. But the process was slow, um, involved several team members, content writers, translators, translation reviewers, and developers in order to get that content onto the site. complexity, we thought to ourselves, how can we streamline the process of delivering accurate information about voting in multiple languages to the American public? Content management system. So that's the reason we're here. Uh, it will fix all our problems, right? Kind of. This has been an improvement overall for Vote.gov. However, there were some tricky problems to um, be able to solve in a multilingual system and new things to learn related to multilingual language management. And that's what we'll talk about for the rest of our time today. Um, so let's take a look at some of those multilingual challenges we experienced in the world. Um, we'll start by looking at configuration. Uh, Vote.gov started as a bilingual website, English and Spanish. And we have been tasked to expand the language offering to an undetermined limit. But we were, we were also unsure of which languages we were going to support. So we have to support any language. Um, 
um, Drupal provides a lot of the out-of-box configuration translation features and a list of translation contributed modules. And we knew we had to plan for conditions such as right-to-left languages, languages with subtags, languages with an unrecognized language code. Um, so we'll briefly look at the core modules supporting translation. So there's the language module, which is core, allows you to configure the languages in the application. Here's an example of what that configuration page looks like. You'll notice that there is a Chinese simplified, Chinese traditional, as I mentioned earlier, on the subtags. Um, next is the content translation module itself, which allows you to translate content in the application. So here's a shot of what that configuration page looks like. Um, finally, there, there are two other core modules, Interface Translation, which allows you to translate the interface text and determine the current interface language, um, and Configuration Translation, which allows you to translate text and configuration. And here's an example of the user interface uh, page. So, this is one of the things that's important to determine when you're starting out with translation is to determine whether or not it's a symmetrical translation or an asymmetrical translation in the start. Uh, symmetrical translation just means that the content presented to the user is the same for each translation. An asymmetrical translation means the content presented to the user diff is, is different somehow. Maybe it's just uh, additional content added or subtracted. Both.w uh, uses a, a symmetrical translation. But we knew we had to create a system that was going to be able to kind of adapt for the future because we were uncertain about how that might, might change as we expand the content. So as you see here, this is an example of asymmetrical. FTC's website, so you can see that the homepage is different for English and Spanish. Symmetrical uh, example from actually from Bo.gov itself showing that we have the same content presented just in a different language. Um, so one of the most important aspects of implementing symmetrical or asymmetrical is to how you configure the translations at the content level, level and the field level. So content data is comprised of field data, is comprised of, and it can be referencing other content data which has field data. Um, so it gets kind of complex as to how and where you set the configuration for translations based on the field or for uh, so let's look at an example. Here's an example of a featured card uh, that we use on the site. This is a component that is based off of paragraphs. Uh, it's paragraph entity. It's configured as translatable. You can see that in the checkbox. The heading field is checked as well. So that's translatable. The cards field is not translatable. And why is that important? Because when we talked about earlier about saying that we wanted to use a symmetrical translation solution. This means that the content of those cards would be translated separately, but the cards themselves would remain the same across all translations. So we don't want to have different. Uh, we don't want to have different cards for translation. And this is an example of the card entity that's being. is fully translatable as you can see. So separating your translation across content fields is uh, important. And here is an example of what you would see um, if you're looking at the note edit form. On the English version, you can see that you have the uh, availability of the header and also the cards themselves, but on the translated version, you only have the ability to translate the heading because those cards should be the same parts for each translation. Um, on Hope.gov, we have many links to external state websites. Um, these state sites can be translated or untranslated. We need the ability to provide a translation link when it is available or to default back to a fallback. So we used Drupal field configuration to create a pair of fields for this purpose, which I'll show you on this next slide. Um, here you can see there's a pair of fields, one default and one fallback. Uh, 
or I'm sorry, one default fallback and one fully override. Uh, the default is not translatable, and when something is not translatable, that pop, that propagates across all translations. So it's a shared field across all translations. When it is translatable, then that means that it can be different for every translation. So in this case, we want to be building a fallback, the a link that we set that any tra any translation in any area. So here's what the different things feels will look like depending on if you're on the English one or the translation. And then here's a twig that just shows that we're using the default filter to switch back to the fallback if the override is not present. Finally, there's two reasons we want to support disabling a whole translation. Number one, during the initial translation processing phase, we are not ready to share the language with the public, and also. If there's an emergency case where we get an order to disable the translation for some reason. Uh, so we use the disable language contributed module, which provides configuration, uh, which allows you to disable a whole site translation. This is an example of that configuration page. Um, as you can see, uh, there's an additional checkbox there for disabling the language, and you can also set if you want to redirect that language to another. And next, we will talk more about stream translation in Drupal. Um, so, before we jump into the challenges, um, we're going to talk about um, PO files. So, PO files, portable object files, contain streams of text and their corresponding translation. And instead of like matching it to a key, it matches strings against a default language stream. And we use these files to, so it's used translate content that exists outside of the database. So for example, hard, if there are any hard-coded strings you have in the templates or um, data object strings. So here's an example of like the translation of month October in Spanish. So how are we using the PO files? Well, in boat.gov's case, we created a custom module called boat utility that contains these PO files. And it also overrides any PO files that are accidentally introduced by contributed modules or any PO files that might have been um, created in the system. Um, string translations allow us to do many things, but they also have some limitations that require custom solutions for certain languages. So we'll first go over the challenge of translating dates. So Drupal has a built-in date format translator. So to translate dates, you not only need to translate the strings themselves, so like the month and the day name, but you also have to translate the order of those strings um, and add and remove any supporting text that is part of the date. So here you will see that we created a custom long date um, format. And here's an example. Um, you can create custom formats used across the site, and then you can also translate the formats. Um, the formats use the PHP date formats, which the manual is actually linked right there in that uh, interface. So on the top is an example of Spanish with the day, name, month, name, year, number separated by the dead particle. Um, and then on the bottom is an example of Bengali. Now, in Bengali, you actually have to translate the numbers. They have different characters. And we noticed the numbers are not translating if they use something other than the Roman numerals. So we started to dig further into the PO files. The data object stream was used English by default, so we added the translated parts of the dates into the PO files. On the left are the translated day and month names, which were working correctly. Um, note that we did add something called message context for the month stream so that this translation would only be applied to the long month name and not a matching piece of content somewhere else um, within our content. On the right, you'll see we attempted Bengali number translation in the PO files, but then PO files only work for strings and not numbers. We discovered that as of when we implemented this, that there was no default way in Drupal to translate numbers. 
So what did we do? We needed a custom solution, and we were back to the JSON file. <laughs> so we um, loaded the, we created like a um, array of um, translated numbers for maybe like four or five languages, and loaded it in preprocess um, into a variable called T numbers, and then we used that within the tweak files. And success. So you'll see here that we were able to successfully translate the numbers themselves. The solution does work, but it requires the extra step of adding to JSON and maintenance. Um, this is okay because the translations of numbers don't change. Um, and this could be a future improvement to Drupal, and then we can retire the solution. So the next challenge is conditional string translations. So our Korean translator came to us and said, hey, so for the state name, so like Washington State, Florida State, there is a specific character that needs to be appended to the names in English, but not for the territories. And unfortunately, with the way that we set it up, the states and territories were the same content type. So we weren't able within that in the interface to just add, um, like append that character just for the states. So instead, we added a translation of the string state and performed conditional string replacement within the template for this case. So we put that translation in the PO file, and then on the right, we checked it within the template whether the current language was Korean and whether, oh, and we also had to add an extra field to um, to denote whether it was a state or a territory, just like a Boolean to check. Um, and then we appended the state character with the, um, yeah, so we did that and then we um, were able to make that work. So you might think, why not just put the character within the template? Well, we wanted to have this repeatable across la languages, um, just in case we added a new language and that language also did the same thing. So you wanted to avoid um, having all these different languages within the template. So here you'll see on the left, um, Washington State with the character, and Puerto Rico does not have the character. Let's take a look at some of the multilingual challenges with navigation. So as I mentioned earlier, Bodega has a lot of links. Um, they go to external sites. Um, either state sites, government agency websites, and one of the requirements was the ability to uh, link menu items to translated content on external websites. Drupal 4's menu system does not allow overriding menu links in translations, and so what we ended up using was the translatable menu link URI module, which just allows the ability to override the link, the menu link for translation. Here's an example of how that might be, how it might look. Um, so just like I used in the field link example before, there is a shared field, which is the one on the right hand side for the English. Um, and then there's an override field, which is this translatable, translatable external link override field um, that's added on the right for the translation. And as we process and review translations published, there's a potential delay crossed by some languages um, and sometimes there's fewer pages than other translations. So we needed the menus to be dynamic to show only translated pages in the current language. And for this, we use the contributed module menu uh, multilingual, which allows you to add all the configuration options for your menu blocks to make sure that you're only showing the translated versions. Um, so here's it has an additional two checkboxes. You can see on the bottom line we have the link check for hide menu items without translating content. One more related consideration is that there's a potential for some pages to have fewer translations than other pages, which means that we need the language selector also to be done. Uh, and only show available translations of the current page. So in this case, we use 
the language switcher extended module, which just adds additional functionality uh, and configuration to the page for the language switcher. And you can see that we can alter the behavior for when a language is not, or a page is not translated in a specific language. In this case, we're hiding the language uh, switcher. with the multilingual advisor on um, the development of our language selector. And one of the requests we had was to display both the endonymic name and the English name for language execution. Uh, an endonymic name is the name that a people of a certain language call the language themselves. Um, sometimes they're the same. And so in the case, as you see above here, um, our language selector, um, for instance, you know, Tagalog is the same for both English and so it doesn't show it doesn't there. But for the other ones, it does. So what we did is we created a preprocessor um, that allows us to kind of manipulate the template variables and, and insert the English one into the template. Here's an example of what that looks like at the top, the lines 6 through 11. We are just grabbing all of the language names uh, in the array that we can use, and then we're looping through all the links, identifying and matching the ones that um, are, uh, are the same. And if they're not the same, then we're sending the English variable to the template. Um, the language which are shared through all the translations on the site, and we need screen readers to be able to uh, correctly identify and use the correct language we're reading those links. So, talk about sending the English variable also to the three templates so that we can see the English name we're to make sure that both of those are going to have the language. So um, we created a custom template inside of our theme which just allowed us to override the behavior and alter the markup so that we can correctly set uh, and apply the link attributes around each of those pieces in our site. So on line six, you can see here that we're applying the correct value for the language itself. And then for the English one, which is on line seven, we're applying the name value at the end, so that we can identify that it's English and we can have the right value. All right, for our last category, we will explore theming our multilingual website. So the first thing is language font compatibility. So when designing and building a multilingual site, you have to make sure that your fonts are compatible, as compatible as possible across all of the languages, um, and focus on testing languages that use non-working characters. Um, and another thing we discovered too, which we'll get to in a second, is um, what fonts the translators you're using, you're working with, use really matter. Um, yeah, so we'll go into custom fonts. So speaking of translators, so we have two Native American languages on our site, which we're really proud of. However. Um, there aren't many translators available, and therefore we had to kind of make sure that we were adapting well to the way that they uh, translated. Um, and the translator sent Navajo files to us without a special font applied. So as you can see here, it kind of has like random characters. Um, it doesn't look the way that it should. So we needed to add an overwrite font for Navajo. So in the current language is Navajo, the um, Navajo font files given to us by the translator are loaded, and the default fonts are overwritten by the Navajo font. And that is what it looks with the font. However, adding overrides adds a lot of complexity, and there's sometimes where you need to exclude the override. So we'll go back to the language picture where we have the two different language names and now with the Navajo font applied, uh, the English name comes out looking like this with a weird uh, character and doesn't uh, 
read out well with screen readers. Um, and therefore, we had to exclude the amount of the font for this particular um, component. So we had to add a class to call no novel font. <laughs> Um, and then we were able to um, add that class to the language loops. Okay, and then for another thing, consideration for theming is right to left languages. Um, on Book.co, we have Arabic. And one of the things that we realized is we're very used to reading from left to right, uh, and that's just kind of the way we think about it when we're designing and we're coding. So when we uh, would create a component and not do the testing that we should have done, we end up with problems like this with the search component and that arrow not showing up where it needs to be. Um, so how could we adapt the theme to work for the right to left languages automatically. Um, so some of the things we've done is replacing any left and right styles that we could with the logical properties of start and end. Um, also using the RTL attribute within the styles to add specific overwrite styles. Um, we've looked images, menus horizontally, and then going forward, making sure that we have right to left languages as a test case as we're uh, designing and building. Um, note for those using um, USWDS components, um, we did have to override some of the default behaviors of the components in order to make this work and kind of work um, with that team to kind of bring some of that knowledge back. So this would be an example of the code. Um, at the top flipping a uh, uh, horizontal flip of an image across the x-axis and then within the in-page map um, setting margin and pattern based on um, logical start and properties rather than right and left. Okay, and that is the result. I'm not locked on my computer. <laughs> okay, so that is the result of the uh, state selector um, component and the fixing of our right to left styling. Okay, now we'll go into our key takeaways. Okay, so one of the things that we uh, that we learned was that you need to, when you have a multilingual website, instead of thinking we're going to build and design for English and then we're going to translate everything, uh, as you can see, it leads to a uh, problem like overrides that you have to do, and it's better to start every task kind of thinking about uh, some of those multilingual considerations and making sure. Every part of the team, whether it be content, design, we have a multilingual advisor, and just taking that into consideration holistically. Uh, what will you say? Another thing is to just make sure you plan your development to be scalable and flexible because things change with translations, as we saw with the right to left translation. Um, starting, starting, to, starting out with logical properties would have solved that issue all to begin with, but um, it's a matter of just thinking about those things ahead of time to try and make sure that you're accounting for some of the changes that may come with the content changes that um, expand the content of, of that particular element on the page, understanding how that text might wrap or, or whatnot, but just testing, 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 that's important, especially with um, what's on the board. Yeah, and for um, for the third, so we'll try, we'll try new solutions out, but also make informed decisions based on analytics and feedback. So our new site that just launched two weeks ago, um, we have um, 
set up data analytics to kind of see, okay, which uh, languages are people using overall, um, which languages are people using per state, what voter guides are people using um, per language, and kind of um, iterating and making important decisions about the site going forward based on that. Today we offer 19 languages on vote.gov. There's a link um, to our code if you're interested in looking at the code database that we have. It's all And there's also a multilingual session that's happening on the same time. We'll take any questions now if you can. Also, on you. Make sure you register to vote too. <laughs> Translators, uh, mostly within federal government, uh, 
So there's like multiple groups, like within the State Department and the Department of Defense that do uh, this. Um, the exception would be the Native American languages, so we did have to kind of track out for that. Where 
the game is a good sale. I have to disable the language. We don't really want to do that. We want to make sure that we keep, keep keeping things available. Um, that that's the same thing. The last specific thing. Yeah, I think I have to add to that. So, for instance, one of the challenges we had early on was with the Avalo translations um, because um, there's kind of a rotation on that. When we were first starting, it was a volunteer base. Um, and so at some point, the Avalo translators was no longer available. And so we still had to make updates to the website, um, but we, we couldn't make updates to the Avalo website. So we didn't have a translation. So, so obviously, that was a sale of the teams that we needed. So we had the ability to have alerts come to the page that notifies users that things are outdated um, and that they should go reference the English content for their days. We also have the ability, like I mentioned earlier, about taking the entire site, uh, that entire translation down if it's invasive and there's some issue that you know, it's just uh, this information. Um, but, but we also have uh, availability to just not have a page published. So for instance, um, the our guys on our website right now, we don't have Spanish, we're working on all the other translations to get added. But those where we are at links are not present in the menu because, like I mentioned earlier, we have a menu uh, translation configuration. Just to make sure that uh, it only shows languages that are available. So, so and what Samir was saying earlier, so, so our, our homepage is translated into every single language, but not the content is not translated into every single language. And that was because we wanted to maintain the the ability for people to go to those language home pages. And then we, we created a banner at the top of the page, which allows them to go to the legacy page with, with the legacy content fully translated as we start looking through the translations of that home page. So it's not for more error, errors as well as these pages. Because English and Spanish are our two uh, core uh, users on the site. 